Hello, everybody, and welcome to the News Paste Podcast. And I'm Johnny Vedmore, your host. And today I'm here with, uh, as I say every week, someone very special. <laughs> but this guy is very special. Uh, Nick Potosky is uh, a, a very interesting man whose expertise are in medical anthropology. Um, uh, instead of screwing up what he does, I'm uh, going to hand over to him. And he's going to tell us in detail and give us a little bit of a spiel, which is something that's going you're all going to find interesting. But basically, um, some of the uh, interest that I have in his work is uh, around my. Um, I, I've of course looked into the history of gain of function research, and this is a man who knows a lot about certain areas of that, but also about medical anthropology in general, and a lot about um, viruses that you know some say have been created and some say have come from nature. And of course, the arguments have got to be made, but at the moment, the argument seems to be on one side. Um, so he's on Odyssey and Rumble. You can find channel 20th Century Medical Anthropology out there. And he has a Zotero, which I never heard of Zotero.org before. Um, Zotero.org uh, slash Fox says what slash library. Fox says what. Um, and that's really interesting. That gives you some really good sources and really good evidence for the stuff we're about to speak to today. You can find him on Twitter at, pick, uh, at Pizza Pickles Per. Oof, a pizza pickles purse. Someone's someone's got it out for me. I dare, in for me, I tell you. And it's Nick. So, Nick, thanks for being here. And um, can you tell the people a little about yourself um, and the area of research, which obviously keeps you in fold? Hi, Johnny, and hi everybody out there in in uh, the internets, the interconnected tubes. Um, I'm uh, a interdisciplinary investigator. And the area of focus and the form of how I like to look at the material in um, a variety of different resources uh, is a structure called medical anthropology. So it's the detailed structure of anthropology, which is history plus plus history in a pr particular format um, that includes data about language, data about actual science and in this case biology and and virology um, as well as um, you know getting it right having having well sourced and triangulated evidence about um, how you interpret and in many cases reinterpret history um, through the lens of this this focus so that's that's a little bit about the practice my background in an academic sense at university uh, is I I had a, a bit of a I, I don't know in in British culture who to liken this to but um, I had a I had a bit of a false start with academic science I did not go into the ivory tower and become a professor um, or the PhD doctorate I started up the ladder and very quickly the questions that I was asking got me a boot in the face. And yes. I realized, yeah, that uh, there's a whole lot in science, particularly in public health, um, that you're not allowed to ask. And so that that really helped me figure out, wow, that's going to be a problematic environment. And I could I could certainly extrapolate what was, you know, five, 10 years later going to look like. And at the same time, I had uh, friends and colleagues who were clamoring for me to get into technology. They're like, oh, you're a great nerd. Come over here and, and get a great job and get going over here. So I was able to do that. And so I live kind of that um, Bruce Wayne, Batman sort of, of existence. Uh, and and the dividing line being what I do in the daytime is my boring, you know, the secret life of Walter Mitty, just that that private, simple plotting uh, nobody life of getting a great paycheck and and moving up in in a career, uh, and then 
in my personal space, I've been able to go back and continue investigating and leveraging the great work that's occurring in universities. I'm not, I'm certainly not anti science or anti um, empirical research by any stretch. I'm, I'm thrilled by the advances in diagnostic and imaging technologies in particular, but um, I didn't have to then live inside the farm. I was able to be myself. Um, I was able to form opinions. And I found very quickly that it was most effective, as you and I touched on earlier, um, to really start with the grounded whistleblowers, um, not, not someone who just posts a meme or posts something you know, on the internet, uh, an idea or a thought or gossip, but to start with people who have some measure of credence and uh, look at their publications, look at the message, and look at their references. That's really where my chops as an actual investigator began, was when I put aside my quick um, personal judgments, my, my you know, your, your quick opinions that you tend to come to, yeah. oh, I don't believe that, uh, whatnot, and instead said, I need to approach this, this message that this person with three letters behind their name, you know, whether it's a PhD or an MD, uh, has taken time. They've put their career in the crosshairs to come forward with the message. It's probably worth looking at what they're saying and not just reading it and deciding whether or not I, I agree, but looking at the substance of what they've said. So that's that's kind of the the origin story. That's my X Men story. That's a brilliant. Uh... Introduction. Some of the things you said already had me uh, things bursting in my 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 head there. And uh, I, of course, I mean, you enter into a professional world where you've got um, all of these scientific papers around you. What what time are you starting to look at these scientific papers? What's this kind of era? Um, so, my first encounter with um, I'd say the most significant. So I, I guess sort of the linchpin of me getting pulled into learning about biowarfare, learning about HIV, Lyme disease, Ebola, other other uh, we'll say microorganisms. Let's just call them call them that for now. Was probably about 1988, and it was a rainy night. And in the city where I lived, there was a large bookstore, and I knew that they had a gay and lesbian uh, re reading section. It wasn't, it, this wasn't, you know, a, a, a pornography shop. It was a proper bookstore. Uh, and I, I went downtown and tromped in through the puddles and walked into this, you know, uh, brightly lit bookstore, walked over to the LGBT section because there were just four letters at that point. And there was a book that jumped off the shelf. And uh, it was by Dr. Alan Cantwell. That was really, truly um, my first introduction to a bench scientist and a clinician. So let's, for those that don't know really what I'm talking about in those two different distinctions, a clinician is your, uh, you know, your foot doctor, your heart doctor, your general care practitioner. A bench investigator can be any number of folks that do work in laboratories or there are academic investigators that aren't in the lab. There's lots of different categories. But I had never looked at a science paper, paid attention to a single thing about grown-up formal scientific process, uh, anything about it. I, I did find in you know my my uh classwork but it was you know dissect a frog memorize you know the parts of the anatomy memorize this you know how do you balance an, uh the atomic valence of you know these those those balancing equations in chemistry one and two i did just fine with that stuff but it, there was no practical application and i never thought of health and science and defense and public health, the big entities, uh, in any kind of a systems model. So that was the beginning of it. And my reaction was instantly to reject it. Here was um, a, a dermatologist who had worked in the front lines of HIV as it emerged in Los Angeles. And not only was he a dermatologist taking care of patients with Kaposi's sarcoma, but 
he was a cancer investigator. So he, he wore both of those two hats we described. He went and did um, work with the biopsies that he would take from someone's skin. Who and is this would, beautiful man that you speak of? We, we just lost him. We just lost him at the beginning oh, no. of, uh, of 2021. This was Alan Ralph Cantwell Jr., uh, and he and his partner uh, lived in right under the Hollywood sign in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, he, he wasn't anything to do with Hollywood besides that he had great clients that came into the Kaiser practice that he worked at for his entire career. He was a dermatologist at Kaiser. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning. Okay. So that was the beginning of you. And, and, when you was how long did you study the uh, have you just continuously can uh, like studied papers since then is this been part of what you do all of the time uh no when i encountered his work i as i mentioned earlier i i rejected it oh, I, so in, you, I was i was absurd to do so i would have gone so much further so much faster if I hadn't been young and arrogant, I mean, who doesn't know the tune, you know, to that song, Every, everybody has regrets about maybe rash things they did in their childhood. Well, this one was huge. When does your childhood end? You know, well, <laughs> just, uh, I mean, I just got to pull my collar there for people who can't see and say, yeah, we've all, we all make these decisions. But I mean, I know adults, grown adults who d decide to reject really strong concrete evidence because it goes against uh their their inner principle that has been built over time um so when did that change how how long till i i'm i'm i i know that that we're gonna um have a bit of a presentation soon so we get to know sure. some of the details about about what you work with but i'm very interested um to to know uh, like through the eighties and the nineties, what was your experience of science and 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 what what which path did you tread? Uh, minimal experience. I had no path to tread because my nickname, really, honestly, was Ferris Bueller. <laughs> Honestly, I was one of my favorite movies, of course, when I was, but young. not a good role model, Johnny, not, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I I've had lots of fun being Ferris Bueller. <laughs> I know. Well, okay. Agreed, okay, agreed, well, agreed. okay. Everything, everything in moderation. Yes. Yeah. Having Ferris moments. That's the takeaway, but <laughs> indeed, I indeed. adopted Ferris as myself it's, well it's it's finding the balance between being ferris and being cameron it's that's the the, the yep. constant eternal struggle we are all going through yep yep i love cameron i love mm. i love everybody that just you know all of the characters um the dynamic of ferris and genie of the <laughs> catharsis that he had with his sister when they mm -hmm. came to understand the nature, the empty nature of sibling rivalry. Yeah, yeah, And they yeah, defended yeah. each other at the end. That was like, yes, that was, uh, you know, my epic era my of epic era of movie making for young adults to sway you in a direction where you go, wait a minute, I can use certain bits of logic now. I've seen that movie. That's a, a rare thing. Anyway, we're getting off. Uh, we're get, getting no, off track, Ferris. Not we're getting off track. You're almost you're almost driving my dad's car off uh, uh, out of the window. So, so I never had to do that. Never did. Yep. Never had one lesson. That's my favorite, favorite mm -hmm. one of my favorite Ferris Bueller lines. Um, yeah, yeah. But to your, your question was, you know, how did you apply? How did you emerge and evolve and start applying yourself to science in the early years? Mm -hmm. I didn't. I mm -hmm. saw Cantwell's book. I stood there quite brazenly and read it cover to cover and then put it back and didn't buy it. Um, and the words hung in my mind and my heart and my soul as I oh, was continuing through oh, no. the flames of PTSD as more and more as I was getting of the age of being sexually active and really being at risk of HIV. That's and seeing the people my age and particularly five to 10 years older people who were in the prime of their health. The people that you you know that walk down the street and you're like oh i need to go to the gym i need to look like that guy um that's the kind of folks that were getting sick and it was continuing so i didn't have any any i think any room in my mind i just thought if i can just 
uh, I felt like dodging meteors, you know, like a cartoon, like a little character scampering around the landscape. And at the same time that there was attraction and interest and a love interest in someone else, I had this horrible dichotomy of suspecting them and wondering if they were honest and wondering if they'd really been tested and who had they slept with all. It was a, it was a very, very, that's its own story. And I've never really opened that book um, in, uh, in full. I've told it, it's a pattern though. That stuff. book is a pattern. That book is a pattern that um, everybody who was uh, in the gay community during the uh, late eighties and throughout the nineties and onwards psychologically um, have kept, you know the 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 suspicion of of their partners due to the fact of how much uh advertising was given to this um i suppose i, I or I, I how much purchase was given to the idea that homosexuals somehow did this to themselves that's, that's precisely the value and what i i really appreciate your point and that then that that's in your consciousness that that you're clear on that um that is one of the uh it's a bittersweet pill uh one of the things about this that i care most about in offering and providing to listeners who actually might take the time to go and look at the papers and you don't have to learn thousands of words of scientific jargon. You don't have to get a PhD to glean what was occurring in the science, the direction and the trajectory that they decided to move in. And there's, this isn't like find you're, you're going to see. This isn't like finding a little bit of broken pottery in the earth and scratching your head and, and conjuring up in your mind the rest of the society that you think it might be. This is an entire city of stone. You'll see the aqueducts. You'll see every type of room. You'll see the grand plaza. You'll see how it all came together and in ways that are indelible for you. So it's going to be a shock for those of you that put your nose into the material. The closer you are to trauma about AIDS, I, I see in the younger gay kids just um, an ambivalence about what it did to the community before oh, Truvada and other things that kept HIV seemingly at bay. But and, and I'm grateful that it didn't keep burning down people's lives. I'm not resentful of that change, but I think that there's a real value in this research for um, LGBT folks of a certain age and people in healthcare. I've had some very spiritual connections with folks that took care of AIDS patients back before there were any options when it was AZT, uh, you know, that was it. And AZT would just bring them right down the drain. Um, yeah. I, I, I've had very meaningful connections with clinicians and there's a stitching back together in their heart about what it all meant. And they, they could exclude that whole horrible American televangelist crap about revenge from God and you break God's will and look what he does to you. That kind of stuff that Billy Graham um, and others spouted all during the 80s. This is your healing, but it's a fire, people. It's, it's a cleansing fire. And there's nowhere to hide, unfortunately, from the substance of the material. And I sound a little bit foreboding because for those of you that really care about this, it's going to be very jarring for you. It's going to call into question um, and I think you mentioned it earlier, Johnny, um, a it's going to activate for some of you a function called confirmation bias. And it's as simple as that little toy you used to play with as a child that had a star shaped hole and a square shaped hole and a round shaped hole. And the different pieces don't fit in the wrong hole. They only fit into the hole that, that it's supposed to. That's equivalent to material no matter how substantive how voluminous that i'm going to be providing you that because you can't or won't accept the moral implications of how it came to be you'll reject the material and for those of you that go through that experience i would just like to offer you my personal um welcome welcome aboard because i did it too
I said, no way, no effing way. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's, I appreciate the opportunity to preamble and to say a, a, a very important part of why. And there are so many of you that lost people to HIV, or you were a support to someone that dealt with and struggled with HIV AIDS, whether it ended in an unfortunate death, or it's part of their life. You know, it's, there, like I said, there's kind of two different generations of attitudes about it. Um, but what's most important at the end is you'll hopefully be left with a lot of very solid pieces that you can then compare to the arguments and discussions that are occurring in the, in the present day about coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It's uh, oh my God. I'm I, 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 I it's it evokes a load of emotion inside me. Uh, a load of things pop into my head when you talk about this whole era, because I was only young. I was only young and you're so impressionable when you're young and the fear, I mean, my fear of, of the idea of AIDS and HIV um, just given to me by the media all around me made me not want to look at a lot of the information, makes you not want to see the truth. And then I've had other experiences in my life, uh, like elements of things like September the 11th and other things where you've realized, okay, you, you've got, you've ob obviously something isn't right, obviously, and you keep looking and keep looking and you discover something bigger and you discover so that it fractures your whole idea of, of what you, what you understood was going on with scientific papers. When I've got, when when COVID happened was the first time where I'm like, I'm going to go start looking through scientific papers because I've never done that before. And I found them looking o ominous with this wrapped in jargon and letters and numbers and, and, and set in a database hard to download. You have to look around to get the right PDF or you have to have special university login to get it. And, and when you finally get it and you, you get past all of the, the rubbish, what you you do is you find someone who either wants you to understand what they're saying in both scientific terms and general terms or you find that someone doesn't want you to understand what they're saying and they'll only explain it in scientific terms so once you look at a lot of papers you discover that there's a load of people who there is a it does it does tell a story it does um instantly you don't have to you you discover you don't have to be a scientist necessarily to understand what the point is and this is all very exciting right so where are you taking us nick take us somewhere exciting please absolutely so i conduct and have been for many many years as we start into this i'll explain the format of what i'm doing for you and who began this tradition so this began in Los Angeles in the mid 80s with a doctor of internal medicine, an MD, who just also happened to have other specialties. He was also a gastroenterologist and he was also a, uh, you know, so general MD, gastroenterology, internal medicine and pathology. And it's that mm. pathology that everybody should stand up and yell, bingo, as, as a scientist who can see the systems of disorders and disease from etiology to long-term, you know, general neglect of human beings to their issues and problems, uh, to presentation of disease, to the forensic analysis of what happened, you know, the post-mortem. So he started doing this uh, and grabbing together um, really mixtures of those two hats we talked about, investigators or researchers uh, and clinicians, people who have some kind of a practice, whether general or specialized. And he would sit them down on a couch. Uh, the, this, this is the origin story of Dr. Alan Cantwell, my colleague, who I did actually meet and had the great fortune of um, studying under his tutelage, just independently, but over a matter of years, he helped guide me through what he had learned and nudged me towards deeper wells of additional information. Um, but Dr. Robert Strecker is who we're talking about, this amazing, amazing man. And he was from Springfield, Missouri. We just lost him in 2018 head-on collision between Las Vegas and Needles, California. He was on his way home. Uh, 
he had a, a GI practice in needles. Um, but Robert would, would sit these folks down and Alan Cantwell was one of those friends, his cancer doctor and investigator friend, his hero, Virginia Livingston called him up and said, Alan, you've got to come over on Saturday night. There's this amazing uh, doctor of internal medicine named Dr. Strecker. He's got some wild theories that he's going to be sharing with us. And he claims that he's got a whole lot of evidence. We're all going to get a, a pile of, of stuff. Mm. And that's exactly how he did it. It would last about three hours. He would put up a whiteboard. He would diagram his theories about the genetics of where he thought the, the pathogen came from in nature, which is really the basis of most bioweapons. This whole, you know, people blabbering on about CRISPR and we can make fully synthetic molecules. Yes, in the last 10 years, there have been some very interesting advances, but it, the basis of virology and thereby bioweapons is the animal kingdom and veterinary science. That's really the heart of where all of our weapons come from, like anthrax, um, the prionic disorders, uh, the, the tick based disorders and HIV, which came from chimpanzees. So what I'm going to be doing in just a second here, if I can click and talk at the same time, there's my decks, is I'm going to share uh, and present out uh, a timeline. I will not read the slides to you. I think there's one slide that I'll read. Uh, but this is the original sort of OG presentation that I assembled in my collegiate work during one of my degrees. I don't talk about where I got my degrees, what they are. Um, I, I did uh, move close to science and then bounced off of science like I described. But uh, regardless, uh, this, is, this is one of the pieces that I created and it's been a good um, consistent sort of yardstick to say, okay, how do we get people's heads wrapped around this? How this could have happened? Um, and I'll give you a, a quick little, like, you know, the underground tunnel. Uh, what do you call the train line map that's got the dots in the line? What do you call that kind of map, Johnny? Oh, um, what, what do you mean? The, the train line map? What, like, yeah, when you go, map? when you go, when you, you go to the underground and you get on your train, you get in, oh, you know, get in the tube um, and you sit down and you look up and there's the line and it's yeah, got yeah, dot, yeah. dot, dot, dot. But is there a yeah. proper name for that? Probably. What well, can you please tell me that you, you you already know the proper name for that? No, I'm not testing oh. you. I don't know. You're British. You guys invented that particular type of diagram, so I thought. Yeah, you might know. yeah. No, I don't. Okay. I don't. Okay. We'll Sorry about that. I'll ask. Me. I'll ask the god of Britishness later yes, and please. see if he knows it. <laughs> All things British, every bit. Oh. So, oh, everything okay. British. Yes, I know. Anyway, go uh, on. <laughs> okay, so now is the time to put up the scary PDF. Here we go, kids. Boop. Woo. And uh, this will be something that we also share out. There's a link to this. I'm not giving it out now because I don't want you reading ahead or getting distracted. Okay, mm -hmm. but you're welcome to this. This is this is my gift to the world. Is this PDF, mm -hmm. and and inside of it is the basis for an argument a hypothesis, I would say a theory, if we're talking about the, the proper gradations of a scientific theorem to a proof, um, I'd say it's a theory, definitely, uh, that HIV came from an era of science that began in the 1950s that they had a name for. It was called medical primatology, like primates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it meant that so much was happening in pharma production and in experimental human investigations, like solving problems for diseases and creating new medications. And then, unfortunately, as most of us know that look back at this era of history, the war never ended. You say Cold War because there weren't fires from bombs anymore. But boy, it was hot in the labs. Those Bunsen burners were still running. Um, and we went right into a very aggressive era of biowarfare. Um, and, and I'm not going to, this will not be a deep, deep history lesson about all about the 50s and post-World War II. There are incredible scholars. There are so many people, documentarians, authors, professors, uh, just all sorts of folks who have done 
excellent, excellent work of really excavating the raw and un, uh, we'll say the, the, the unspun version of history. You know, the really looking at the real deal. What did we do? Who did it? What are the results on contemporary society, medicine, public health, things like that? All of this is the nature of anthropology. And because we're talking about medicine, that makes it medical anthropology. Let's proceed. So there are a lot of different primate pathogens that are now in public health. Uh, and friends, by the way, um, this will be an abbreviated version of the timeline. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really try and, and put the speed up to uh, a faster rate so that we can just explore. And Johnny and I can come back and, and click on certain things and, and dig in. So <clears throat> the use of chimpanzees and rhesus macaques are really the two hottest species that bring us into this conversation. The reason the chimpanzees are important is because they introduced us to one of their endemic pathogens that don't cause disease in the animal, um, SIV. That's its contemporary name, simian immunodeficiency virus, CPZ, the type from the chimp. There are multiple types of SIVs. Uh, also, the chimpanzee brought us RSV. You might be seeing ads right now trying to scare seniors into taking an RSV vaccine, a brand new type of product on the market. Well, it's quite an interesting story that RSV used to be called chimpanzee coriza agent for about 10 minutes. And then they said, oh, we can't have a pathogen that's now unfortunately contaminating all kinds of biological production systems uh, being named after a chimpanzee. So they, they renamed it. It's called, it's called redesignation, and they designated it RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, but it came from the chimp. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the rhesus macaque brought us in just a minute. In the midst of this era was an unfortunate sort of uh, shitstorm of public health problems like the polio issue, uh, and then problems with biological agents that caused uh, a, a massive gap in public confidence in biologicals. When I say biologicals, I mean vaccines, kids. There's, but there's a, a parent term now uh, about what an injectable concoction is. So I say biologicals. Uh, in the midst of all of this, there, there was uh, an outbreak of hepatitis and uh, really an ongoing problem with hepatitis B at a huge school. Uh, it was the uh, United States' largest public health facility, I believe, on Staten Island. It's called Willowbrook. There are documentaries and books about what happened with these doctors and the children and the Willowbrook school experience. We'll see these, these scientists again as we go a little further along. One of the important things to note about them is that they were working on hepatitis B vaccines. And in this whole era, everybody was growing a lot of their products and experimental uh, vaccines on chimpanzee and other primate substrates. Substrate means cells that have been pureed, you know, just chopped up, uh, turned into basically a paste. And then you, you know, you work them through a process of filtration and deactivation. You can clear out certain contaminants um, but they continued to use primates in, in much of the experimental science that then got fed to the children or injected into the children. Uh, they did some very, very untoward things. It's an interesting story. Willowbrook is its own little side passage on this rabbit hole. Um, but let's keep going. The chimpanzee Carriza agent we just discussed is still in circulation today. It contaminated influenza vaccines for years until... Finally, they said, oh, yeah, we, yeah, we keep seeing that every time we start the, the, the flu vaccine uh, season, you know, the kickoff, it's time to get your flu shot. We then see a very consistent correlative wave of pneumonia deaths that seem to test positive for RSV. And they figured out that they were giving pneumonia to people. They were spreading it. People that were getting a shot were shedding live virus. So pneumonia is endemic, and now they're giving us a new product 
They want you to take a vaccine to try and protect you from a pathogen that was introduced to public health from a vaccine. I, I'm Greek. I call that an Ouroboros. <laughs> this is a very, very important point in the timeline. And it's uh, really, there are two major bodies of work on this slide that I'd, I'd like to pay homage to. One of them we'll start with is a British investigator named Ed Hooper, who is a fantastic uh, investigator. He's a self-taught scientist, in my opinion, just from the volume, the number of years and the amount of, of study. It's just like, you know, he, he deserves an honorary PhD. But his work and uh, the work of a documentary team that followed the publication of his book in the late 90s uh, really drew attention to a particular event in the Belgian Congo. I don't want to take things away from either of these fantastic pieces of history. They tell the story of millions of people over, uh, over, sorry, over a million Africans in this particular campaign being exposed to raw SIV because they proved in the course of their work between Mr. Hooper's book, the confrontation they had with scientists at the Royal Society in 2001, and then the publication of this movie. Uh, they show, and by the way, the link, the link on this uh, brings you to a free, you know, an, an archive.org version, a public educational version of the film. But it really shows the conduct of science when confronted with the possibility that they might have had something to do with the HIV story. Okay. Now, in my scientific and research experience, what I'm not able to reconcile is one of the major assertions that Mr. Hooper feels is true about the timeline of HIV. As I understand it, I, I believe that he is still of the mind that this was the crossover point for AIDS. And what we're going to continue to look at is what happened after this campaign and the scientists that studied the cancers that followed this campaign. I don't see in the literature the presentation in Africa of uh, wasting disorders pneumonias, capacity sarcoma, or slim disease, which is what they eventually, the first name that locals called the disorder in the mid seventies when it seemed to first emerge. And we'll talk about that event as well. Uh, but what we did see was that this exposure created a great number of cancers in uh, people of all ages. And why it was so uh, important is that the correlate, you know, the, the temporal correlation to getting this oral polio vaccine, meaning a product that was sprayed in the mouth, and then seeing soft palate cancers, jawbone sarcomas, nasopharyngeal cancers in great numbers that weren't in those populations before in people of all ages. And it was the younger patients that were most alarming. It's like, they don't get those cancers. They, we, we don't see those cancers. And why are these little kids getting it? So you'll see that in the literature, uh, in the big Zotero collection, there are some papers about uh, what they called filterable agents. That was one of those nudge, nudge, wink, wink uh, uh, monikers for a, a potentially involved infectious agent that we found in this cancer biopsy but they say filterable agents, and then they go from there. But another piece of the story that a lot of folks that wrap around the axle right here on, on Mr. Hooper's book, who I, if he ever hears this, I'm a super fan and I'd love to have a conversation with you, but I do understand that there have been some, uh, there's been some intimidation about uh, him really going any further than what he does with his website. He has a, he has a site and he still follows uh, and continues to analyze historical data, scientific data, as well as entering into um, the, the contemporary discussions about coronavirus. Um, but he's just, he's a fantastic man. I, I just have nothing but respect for the work. Um, and my work had to merge the things that they discovered and revealed through these two investigations, as well as everything that followed. So let's, let's take a look at what followed. I told you we'd learn a little bit more about the rhesus macaque and what it did. Well, the rhesus macaque was the primary culprit for introducing 
SV40. Simeon virus 40 <clears throat> is just basically like, think of a parking lot, you know, stall number 40. That's not the formal name. They, they, re they also renamed it the vacuolating virus. Um, there's, there's a couple different scientific designations for it, but originally it was called SV40 because it was on a chart of new um, concerning isolates, new pathogens being found through the use of the ongoing unabated use of primate materials and living animals, by the way, to produce human biological products. So these two heroes, doctors Eddie and Stuart, in the mid 50s, blew the whistle. They were, they were FDA investigators. They were doing precisely what we would expect and hope a public health uh, defender to do their job. Right. And they said, look, we have tested a number of products and we're finding that when we inject them into test animals, they grow uh, immediately. They begin presenting tumors. Um, they're quite aggressive and they, uh, you know, generally all have a fatal outcome. So we've got a real problem in a number of these commercial products. Remember, we're in the maelstrom of lunging forward with investigations to replace the polio vaccine and still trying to grow a number of products into the standard schedule for, you know, what the, the public health authorities say is safe and effective, you're supposed to have to protect you from infectious disease. Um, all of this is happening. Nobody put the brakes on. Um, there was a big alarm about infections during uh, the 1955. There was something called the Cutter Incident. And there was a contamination event that killed several children and paralyzed a number more. And that that's really what set off this polio vaccine race. But if you go back and look, they didn't really stop. They just kept making influenza vaccines and using primates. So the point was that for many products across many years in many countries, a great number of people got simian virus 40. It's sexually transmissible. It is a latent oncogenic virus. Latent means that it goes into sleep cycles. Oncogenic means that it's involved in a great number of human cancers. And it's, it contaminated products for years until they finally decided I, sometime in the 70s. I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't confirm when every single country and every pharma producer stopped using, uh, you know, primate, primary cell culture. But the, the World Health Organization still has in their manuals that they cannot control it. Uh, formalin is a typical, it's a, it's a formaldehyde derivative, is a typical tool used to sterilize cultures. But formalin can't kill SV40 if it's inside of a cell, if it's in the nucleus of the cell. It's already integrated. It's in there. It's a passenger, like someone in a cab. And uh, it can't do its job. You can let you can keep cooking your cell culture for 30 days. I had a very fun, you know, it was a fun discussion with a chemist, microbiologist, you know, someone who, who works all with cell cultures and viruses and stuff like that. And they were describing, they're like, yeah, you can kill SV40 if you leave it in formalin for 30 days. And when you come back, it's just plasma. It's just goo. There's nothing left. You've burned all of the cell. Everything gets destroyed. So that's the lesson is that this little bugger, this contaminant has been a problem for a long, long time. And now in the current era, we're seeing um, papers and confirmed studies in uh, very, very detailed genetic analyses about SV40, SV40 promoter genes. I want to be very precise. They are not saying that they have found the full uh, SV40 uh, virus. It's, it's a DNA virus, which should tell you something about its scale, you know, from a skateboard to a pickup truck. There's a whole scale of RNA to DNA viruses. But this is a DNA virus that can be latent and it gets inside cells and it sleeps. So um, the issue isn't that the, uh, they're finding the SV40 promoter genes in the spike and in, and in the vaccines. It's the unknown interaction of an SV40 promoter in these new biological products with someone who might have a latent SV40 infection. Also see current discussions on cancer rates. Let's keep going.
So how do you solve a problem like Maria? How do you <laughs> catch a wave upon the sand? Uh, you, you have a big symposium where after five years of very vigilant clinical investigative work, including having their work repeated by independent international colleagues who said, yep, we're using the same formula. We use the same safety and production protocols. We did the tests and we're seeing tumors as well. <clears throat> they get all of the big wigs together at what is now becoming, uh, as I understand it, a sort of a quiet, unknown piece of U.S. national defense and public health. And it's this campus, Cold Spring Harbor Labs. For any of you that look at preprint, these are scientific papers that are in review. You'll see in the upper left-hand corner a little genetic logo and the CHL, you know, a, a CSHL uh, uh, acronym, because they are now the hub, the lens for a whole lot of biological science. It doesn't mean that they get to just reject your paper outright, but it's very important to keep in mind that this is an instrument that is currently like think of a cotton gin you know, the, the eye of the needle. It is the deciding point for a lot of science. Uh, and to know the history of Cold Spring Harbor is to know that it's a space to keep an eye on. What I just recently learned is that a huge amount of funding comes from the federal defense and NIH budgets for this facility. They got everybody together. They let Dr. Stewart and Dr. Eddie plea their case they showed them the pictures of the, of the animals after they had grown tumors, again, as large as the animal themselves. They showed the studies from all of the confirmatory labs. They showed contemporary samples to say, look, it was in the stuff in 1955 and we're finding it here in 1960. And then stepped forward Maurice Hilleman from Merck. And he was one of their new darlings. He ended up being in charge of the hepatitis B vaccine division, put a push pin in this man. And he and Dr. Sweet had a paper that, that said, you know, we wash everything with the formalin and it completely inactivates all known and unknown wild primate viruses. So this isn't the problem. They absolutely, they did, a, they did the gaslighting. That was one of the worst gaslighting events in history because the NIH turned away from all of the hard clinical evidence of the last five years of these, these health defenders investigations and looked at Dr. Hilleman and Dr. Sweet's paper and said, you know, this is a much safer, less, uh, you know, less costly path is to get behind this unsubstantiated claim that our current processes are making us safe from these cancer-causing viruses, of which they hadn't even cataloged and isolated and characterized all of them yet. But they stood behind that policy, and that's been the policy of the NIH and therefore the FDA and the CDC ever since. If you ask them now, they'll kick the can and say, oh, you know, there's been some very interesting papers, but we still need to do more studies on SV40. It's not clearly shown to cause cancer. In the meantime, if you go to a pathologist and you say what was in you know, mom's blastomia, uh, or, or sorry, that's not the proper uh, blastoma. There's, yeah, blastoma. What was in the liver cancer? What was in the prostate cancer? Quite commonly, a what's called a helper virus or a satellite virus is simian virus 40 in active genetic expression. So the NIH will maintain this until the cows come home, while in the meantime, they raced to create a cancer industry. I've had a, I've had a scientific insider tell me that, and folks, this is, I know I said I was going to race and this is turning into, uh, yeah, the long form, but I, these very, very important pieces that we can come back and dig into. I've That's had, fine. I've That's had fine. a, Keep going. okay. I've had an investigator share uh, <clears throat> with me that she was privy. This is a historical cancer investigator. I won't name her, but she's as qualified as anyone to speak on this topic. And she expressed uh, that the conversation at the time was, you know, 
we're going to be able to cure cancer very quickly. So let's make sure that we don't let this get out to the public. So in and of that very discussion was a, an admission that they knew their scientific conclusion was wrong and that ongoing increases in cancer rates were directly related as seen in the pathology data to this contaminant and that they still were never going to concede that it should stop or that it did what it was doing. And instead they raced to be, you know, the, the problem reaction solution. They raced to be the solution industry of the Rockefeller cancer model. So that's another huge piece of this that I have to sort of calve off. We're not going to go any further into that piece. But it's, it is, again, as significant as important as the HIV story. This is Dr. Robert Gallo. Gallo, in 1980, late 83 or 84, got stood up at the podium and announced in American press that he was the discoverer of the virus that causes AIDS. Meanwhile, across the pond in France, everyone at the Pasteur Institute in the, in the Luc Montagnier team knew quite seriously and directly um, the legal and ethical gaffe that this was, and they went about starting into the patent fight. That's all the 1980s. If you'd like the story that will show you the FOIA-acquired correspondence between this man and the people that he stole cells from and made clones of and then claimed was his work. Uh, the, the you know patient, truly, the original patient came from the Montagnier team. Go and get a book called Science Fictions. In the meantime, for free, you can go out to the web and look up John Crutzen's website, Science Fictions, and he's got every single one of those PDFs for free right there. He's another fantastic investigator. He encountered a whole lot of grief for publishing about this guy who back in 1962 joined a group of scientists in a, in a project that went on for many years. Part of their work was to maintain and grow out this new network. They called them the regional primate centers. Some of them had two species, some of them had 12, and they learned a whole lot about primate virology and cancer-causing diseases and biowarfare just from taking care of the primates and seeing which endemic viruses crossed over and affected and causes, caused disease in others. But here's the primary thrust of what he was doing. The title of his project was Investigations of viral carcinogenesis in primates. So let's unpack that language. Mm -hmm. We all know what investigation means. We all know what viral means. We all know what primates mean. But what is viral carcinogenesis together? This means viruses that are involved in initiating or directly causing cancer in people. That's what carcinogenic means in a broad sense. <clears throat> but viral carcinogenesis means it's a viral cause, not a toxic cause like smoking or asbestos. So they were looking for cancer-causing pathogens from primates starting in 1962. And who gets stood up at the podium in 1984 and says that he discovered what's causing AIDS? That's a very interesting piece. You can see there's a link down here. I'll just point out throughout the course of the um uh, the slideshow that I'll, again, I'll get you guys a link for this PDF later. There are a number of full text artifacts. I've embedded some, some custom links that you can go and get your own copy of the PDF. You can read it for yourself. You don't have to buy something. You don't have to join a club. You just need this document. And I've made these things visible and downloadable um, through a number of mirror sites. So feel free to help yourself. Just watch for links at the bottom of slides. And that means there's an Easter egg there for you. Okay, come on. There we go. Um, chimpanzee pathogens found in tissue culture. We just talked that to death. And they're now, at this point in time, they're just combining uh, virus A with B or BC or BCD. They're just basically having horse races by making different combinations of um, SV40 and herpes viruses. 
XV40 and Coxsackie virus. They, they have tables that are innumerable, the different combinations they, they cooked up and then inject them into a test animal and observe whether or not there was a presentation of disease. And then most importantly, study very carefully the biochemistry, the genetics, um, everything they can, they can characterize about the expressed pathogens in the disease tissue of the dead animal. That will be, that's the proof, right? That's the confirmation that it was involved in causing the disease and they can then begin to learn some about the disease mechanism. This was the level of the biowarfare work at the time. Uh, the infectious agents, those filterable agents that we talked about, uh, were coming from people of all ages, and most notably from children in all of the areas that had received the Wistar oral polio vaccine that Ed Hooper and the film team that wrote, uh, that created the Origins of AIDS documentary. They all focus on this. The film crew goes back and interviews Africans who were uh, laboratory and chimp handling professionals. They were hired and they were staff at two different facilities. If you want some free evidence of what really happened and whether or not chimps were used at Lindy and in, in the Stanleyville lab, go back and watch that documentary. It's free. Um, it's, it's a little slower. It's not, you know, you're not going to be clutching the dashboard, but it's fantastic and important interviews, not only of the people on site that still live there that tell the real account of what kind of science were they doing, but you also get to listen to two other flavors of Western scientists, ones who begin opining and reflecting on the era and then say, oops, I probably shouldn't say any more and others who absolutely gaslight and deny. And those are the ones that put papers together and confronted Ed Hooper in 2001 at the Royal Society. Um, they perjured themselves. And I have a paper written by Kaprowski in 1958, which is a smoking gun that if Mr. Hooper had had it, he should have just blown it up as a poster and stood outside the Royal Society and said, I'm not going to come inside for your clown show for your staged papers that you've created. Instead, here is Mr. Kaprowski talking about the chimp camp in 1958. That was the big contentious issue because they were all terrified about some culpability of exposing people to SIV. The program that Mr. Hooper, I, I believe he has looked at more of this material <clears throat> more recently, but that is really the basis for where the American whistleblowers jump off is this. It's called the Special Virus Cancer Program. It was called the Special Virus Leukemia Program, and then it was renamed. And in military and intelligence nomenclature, when they say special, that generally means it's got a level of classification. Doesn't mean it's the Manhattan Project. But the way they spread out these projects, one team would work on this little function of cancer, one team would work on mapping um, the lymphocytologies between chimpanzees and people. I see a lot of papers about that, where they're watching which white cells from chimps are lethal, cytotoxic, to white cells in people. Doesn't that sound sort of foundational to the basic disease mechanism of HIV AIDS? They were doing these very detailed sort of honeycomb, I like to say honeycomb, little individual cells. And they had projects set up in universities and in the federal national agencies and in private third party like pharma, Pfizer and Merck, all, you know, all of the big pharma are listed in over the years in these special virus cancer program reports. Uh, here is another Easter egg. This is probably the most important artifact get a copy of this, this download. It's about a 300 page report. It's the final report from this program. So it'll show you the finalized, you know, the most advanced description of the state of the arts that they were practicing, these black arts. Uh, and the reason why I'm so excitable about this particular artifact is because it has hand markups from Dr. Alan Ralph Cantwell Jr., my colleague, my mentor. 
Uh, he held on to this until the very end when I met him face to face in 2019, to about a year and a half before he passed. He had failing kidneys. And he was a he was a cranky Capricorn, and he he wouldn't do dialysis. He knew too much about it and side effects and things like that. And he's like, I'm you know I'm not going to do dialysis. So we lost him in the beginning of 2021. But you can look over Alan's shoulder by downloading this free, difficult to acquire. Well, it's, this is a unique artifact because no one else has Alan's insights, and he will guide you with his yellow sharpie through different focus points, things that caught his eye. And remember that you're, you're seeing it through the eyes of someone who fought AIDS at the beginning on the front lines in Los Angeles as a dermatologist and is also a multidisciplinarian in science. He's a cancer investigator. So quite an important mind shows you precisely what was interesting to them about the science. I will also point out things he didn't highlight that, that are very germane to the issue of biowarfare persisting and what they may well have had to do with, with coronavirus is the beginning of this document is a big welcome to the NIH section. And they talk about how all of these, at this point, quite categorically illegal practices are going to just be welcomed into new departments or existing apartments at the National Institutes of Health. And then if you know anything about Tony Fauci, and the NIAID, they got handed by a warfare charter in uh, in the uh, you know the 9/11 Patriot Act era. The NIA, NIAID got basically they came out of the closet. They said, mm, okay, yeah, we're we're still doing gain of function work, and we're going to be in charge of it now. So he his budget went through the roof. He was the highest paid federal employee, and that was because of huge huge. Uh, subsidies, bonuses from the DOD. Animals are, we've already talked about animals and cross-contamination. They had a lot of outbreaks uh, and that's how they would learn about a new potential. They called them candidate virus. When one new animal would be brought in and another animal's seemingly harmless endemic virus would get transmitted to them through feces or urine or bite or whatever. And then it would cause an outbreak in another species. They would have to cull entire populations as a result of these. Right, right. Now, inducing cancer. This is another concept that I find as, as your tour guide through this dark forest. Remember the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy had to go through that horrible dark forest and the trees were talking and then the flying monkeys came. Um, I'm your tour guide. They're the best. I'm, They're my favorite, the flying monkeys, to be honest. The flying freaking monkeys, man. And I've got a ranger hat. I'm Ranger Nick and mm. I'm taking you through. Um, this is one of the horrifying spots in the tour where I will commonly turn around and realize that I've lost the audience. They're standing with their jaws agape. Uh, cancer can be induced. Part of this project for a couple of years was called the Department of Inducing and Controlling Cancer. They learned a whole menu, a whole, not a menu, a whole freaking spell book of ways the dark home to combine different factors from biology that will cause cancer in people in a short, medium, or long range time frame. This is the second culprit, poor little guy, naughty, naughty, cheeky monkey. This is the sooty mangabe. This is the natural hearth for HIV2, which only broke out on the west coast of Africa. Another, in my opinion, controlled release, probably doing an A-B comparison to check the, the efficacy, um, the transmissibility, the genetic. There's, there's something that's very important. There's an argument that synthesized germs can't persist. I, I would say exhibit A, HIV-1. Try, just try to put the genie back in the bottle. It's persisting. It's doing very well. It's not 100% synthetic. People didn't invent it. People helped it over the fence from the chimpanzee, pantroglodyte, into human cell culture and then into experiments and then weaponized it. And I'm sorry, but that's how it happened. And all of the evidence, you can go back and read it. You can hate me. 
You can deny it. You can slam the book on it. If it causes you great distress, like drinking or, you know, you're really feeling on top of everything that's going on in the world, you can't take this in. Don't, please. Don't, don't look at a thing. Put it aside. But unfortunately, this is the story of biowarfare that happened after we messed up with primatology and mixing in raw primate materials and living animals to produce human biological products. I told you there was only one slide that I would read you. This is why I will read you this. This is the top-down insight of what was happening and not just that we're spending dollars on at the time. It, they hadn't gone in the closet to try to pretend that it was all defensive. Uh, they, Congress knew very, very well. This is an excerpt from a conversation that occurred between the leading doctor in the research and technology group of the U.S. Army, who was right there at Fort Detrick at the USAMRID lab, along with the CIA, and along with a big host of uh, civilian pharmacology partners like Merck and others, and NIH, all sorts of folks. But they were all mixed together. And this is a conversation where they're asking for another chunk of money. And I'll show you how specific they understood what they were buying as they described the intended disease mechanisms. Here we go. Quote, this is Dr. MacArthur presenting a concept. To the, to the Appropriations Committee, quote, within the next five to 10 years, it would probably be possible to make a new infective microorganism, which could differ in certain important aspects from any known disease-causing organisms. Most important of these is that it might be refractory to the immunological and therapeutic processes upon which we depend to maintain our relative freedom from infectious disease, end quote. Um, now, in the per for the purposes of brevity, since I spent, a, you know, really got weighed down in the rapids back in the early part of the slideshow, um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go heavy into Nixon or Kissinger or the CIA. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying we're going to go through the slides, but you can come back and dig wherever you yeah, see yeah, something yeah, yeah, that yeah, wets yeah. your whistle. Let's do that. So at this time, Nixon cool. and Kissinger do a little shell game. You know, they're like, ah, we're not going to do offensive studies anymore. And they took black Sharpies and they went over to the Pentagon and they scribbled <laughs> out the labels on everything and wrote defensive, defensive, defensive on everything. And the reason that I'm going to say that so, uh, you know, with comedy and so confidently is that I studied like Gallo's 1962 project, which persisted for years, I studied the projects that were clearly nothing to do with stopping cancer, only inventing new pathogens that had never existed before in nature and finding more and more aggressive and effective methods at inducing cancer. None of those studies talked about controlling, inhibiting, preventing or reversing. Those are gerunds <laughs> and adverbs or, 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 or verbs that are used for um, anything related to fighting a disease. All of these papers pat themselves on the back about the new, quite dangerous, quite aggressive new chimeras and hybrids. So that's why I talk about their conduct. You can also go and look at, the, at the, their memos that are declassified here. Skip the little labels, the metadata, open the PDFs and read in their own words in language that is not technical. It's not really dated. You will see very clearly the psychology of them trying to get everybody in the press, in public health, overseas to stop saying chemical biological and they're going to try and redefine biological as something that doesn't happen anymore they just want to try to make it go away it's a spin job and that's mm -hmm. the value that you can find in those artifacts this is another smoking gun anti-lymphocytic serum the active disease mechanism in aids not not that the hiv virus has such a cytotology to you that it kills you directly it collapses your immune system. This serum was used 
from the very beginning of this era we call medical primatology. And it's made in an isologous manner. That means if you're doing an experiment with a chimpanzee to do a transfusion to a person, yes, there, are tran there were direct transfusion experiments to do a transplantation or a graft of skin, a tooth, an organ, a tissue type, anything. You would suppress the immune system to prevent rejection of that foreign matter, that, that zoonotic material into the, per, into the human subject by using an isologous ALS preparation. So if we're doing a chimp to human experiment, repeatedly, as we see in the literature, they were exposing people long after Africa to clinical exposures. This is called iatrogenic injury to clinical exposures of massive amounts of chimpanzee pathogens directly because this ALS was no more clean than the hepatitis products. So this is another piece of the story that shows they were creating patients that then would present leukemias and cancers. And they'd say, oh, patient 27 isn't doing so well. Let's do a biopsy. And they would dig in and find that the candidate virus had made it through the zoonotic passage, had made it through the preparation of this laboratory material, had been used and injected directly into a human patient, and in the course of the graft or whatever the experiment was, they developed cancer or leukemia. And then they would isolate and look at specifically, again, those filterable agents. What is presenting in these diseases that is most likely directly or tertiary to the disease mechanism? I already talked a lot about the use of living chimpanzees and their tissues. It went on and on and on and on, and a number of animals. Um, rhesus macaques, a variety of primates were, were used, but it narrowed down as far as the hot zone. It's really the chimps and the rhesus macaques that we, we focus on in this discussion. I told you that we'd come back to that Willowbrook scandal. Um, if, you, if you know who Geraldo Rivera is, the big mustache, mm -hmm. um, yeah. As a young intrepid in, in, in investigator, he got a key to the side door at the Willowbrook facility. Someone in the staff wanted, wanted the public to know. And he just came in unannounced with a film crew. And the, there are some, <laughs> oh yeah, there are some yeah. classic pictures that you can go out on YouTube and just look up Willowbrook School Geraldo. And you'll see him discussing it, going, doing, this is the original expose journalism. And it was a real horror story. So it's one of those cases where I, I don't like paparazzi. And he wasn't doing paparazzi. He, he just got access and he broke the freaking story of Willowbrook. Um, then there was a huge, uh, there was a congressional and, you know, big, big ruckus about it. Uh, and the conduct of those two hepatitis experimenters, those scientists from back in the 50s, came to light. They quickly got out of Dodge and found other things to do. One of them began working as the head of a new hepatitis B chimpanzee-based lab on a little island off the coast of Liberia, Liberia called Vilab 2. And I know anecdotally, I'll, I'll just add this in as you know something fun and, and delicious, um, I know through digitizing Dr. Cantwell's, uh, that's why I went to meet him as I spent a week digitizing everything that was worthwhile from his paper collections. He made a special collection contribution to USC. And I went back and found everything that was unique or difficult to find and scanned it. And that's what I share open source in my, you know, in my materials. Um, but Dr. Prince ends up working and managing this site. And there's a, there's a letter between a high level European biopharma executive who was a field scientist and investigator in this era and worked next to Dr. Prince. And in this letter, he describes a number of incidents and behaviors, and he's quite a sober, cogent, intelligent fellow uh, in a private communication to Dr. Cantwell. So that's why I, until I 
see that he has passed, I'm never going to release that, that evidence, um, you know, cause it's, it's personal correspondence and he makes very direct and clear statements to Dr. Cantwell, please never release this. I would really think that it would, it would be the end of my life pretty quickly if you did. So I'm going to certainly protect his confidentiality, but we can talk about the story. Um, and he was very concerned that Dr. Prince was being visited by CIA. Mm. Well, HIV was released in two populations, in Africa and in the United States, gay hepatitis, men's hepatitis B study. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's quite plausible with that testimony that this site might have had something to do with preparing HIV for mass distribution in those living chimpanzees. Because I've had other virologists and pharmacologists tell me it it's much easier to make a viral titration, a concentrate inside a living being like a prisoner or a chimpanzee than it is to do it in a bottle. It's so hard to keep the cells alive because this is a cytotoxic agent. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, that's part of why they, they, you know, you hear about early research on what was causing AIDS uh, and they talk about having trouble with the lab, you know, cut trouble, keeping the cells alive. Um, it's because the cells they were feeding it were the food for the cytotoxic agent. So they would just constantly destroy the cell culture. Well, I, I think that in this story about Africa, it's quite plausible that Dr. Prince's work at the Willowbrook, no, at following Willowbrook at the Vilab 2 location uh, has something to do with what happened to the African AIDS story. Uh, this is another important um, uh, Easter egg. Get this download. It's a one pager that describes the clinical technical process of acquiring and collecting and characterizing a whole family of different cancer and leukemia samples, isolating any viral agents related to those samples, and then beginning a mutagenic process. They would mutate them with a variety of techniques. Then they would passage them through, think of a horse race, uh, you know, six lanes at least, a whole bunch of different varieties of animal systems and cell culture systems that could then result in yet new recombinations. It's what they were driving for, was just spinning that roulette wheel and spinning it and spinning it. And then they would see um, the progeny here at the end and start the cycle all over again. I've had a lot of people say, where's the paper? Show me the paper that says that scientists and the NIH and the Defense Department made AIDS to kill gays and blacks. Well, this is the technical smoking gun in one mm -hmm. page. It's called so, the SVCP program logic flow chart and all. I'll try and uh, put as much of this within uh, the notes as well for people who are sure. uh, just listening. Yeah. Any, anywhere where I'm calling out one of these things, it's just a link in, in the, I mean, if you guys are seeing these and you type these into a browser right now, you'll get the paper. I don't want you to distract until we're done with the timeline. And then, mm -hmm. you know, all bets are off. <clears throat> this was a problem. This is, I think, probably what uh, helped put my community in the crosshairs. There's a very big, dark, horrifying backbone behind everything we've already unveiled here. And it's called depopulation. Mm -hmm. depopulation involves a list a huge set of categorizations some of them are religious some of them are biological genetic some of them are geographic and you won't be surprised to learn that people that that you know traffic in those circles think davos and others um have a prioritization and i think that this you know the the sexual revolution of the of the 60s the emergence of bona fide gay ghettos in, you know, half a dozen major metros across the U.S. And then this bombshell, the APA and shortly after the American Psychological Association, both delisting homosexuality as a mental illness. That didn't bode well in uh, all of the conservative channels on the American side. I, I don't know if this really created ripples in the UK, but this was a problem. And I, I think it's probably why we were considered as one of those uh, target populations. Gallo is continuing to do that whole merry-go-round thing, right? Of letting or deliberately infecting a human patient with a primate virus, then 
finding those patients that present disease, they're the A state, those are the A students we want to keep, then isolating and repeating the whole process again with biopsies from their cancers. At this point, he's off into the island of Dr. Moreau. I, I won't, you know, we could pull up a paper from the late 70s of him splitting these these leukemogenic, they're called leukemogenic viruses. Most of the classifications he was working were leukemia related, not solid tumors necessarily. Um, but just, just turning them into new uh, crosses, new chi chimeras or hybrids. Um, and it's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And I don't have a handle on, on the story of what happened to them all. And are any others of those in public health or in a product or contaminating I'm good at finding cell stories, you know. I'm good at, good at finding stories. Well, but the thing is, is that as they write about them in these papers from the era, they don't necessarily have their final public designation. So you might think, I've got the tiger by the tail because here's Dr. Da Gallo talking about SV59, but you don't know what it's really called today. Today, it might be called STLV. And how in the world do you disambiguate that leap? It's part of why they love the redesignation tool, because you can just sort of erase things. There's the no sort of uh, redesignation log or chart or, you know, there's nothing that's been created by someone at some point for that uh, specific purpose. In individual papers scattered through tens of thousands of peer review papers. You can find tables, bits and pieces. And yes, there are some, there are, I would assume, certain vinculums uh, of virology and genetics that show the full spectrum of here is the H version of this virus, which means human. And boy, a whole lot of those popped up in the 70s, 80s and 90s because they needed to, to differentiate from their original animal hearts. And how all of those pathogens became H versions, I'm not qualified to tell you. I had to spend all these years confirming every single logistic scientific claim made by the early whistleblowers. And we've already named two of them, Cantwell and Strecker. By the way, the reason I'm anonymous tonight, folks, is because um, Dr. Strecker's brother, Teddy, was found shot in his apartment the morning after a very positive planning business planning session with his brother in LA. And a month later, about six hours away as, as the car drives, um, Illinois state representative Greg Huff was found dead in his condo. He was the one, uh, basically one of two major people of note who had engaged with the Strecker group and was having an ongoing conversation about the research. What year so that was, was it that they died? 1988. Mm. August. Very interesting. Yeah, August and September 1988. I would I would surmise from what I've learned about the um, the big bad, they call it Murder Incorporated. We're talking about a number of entities that you could tap on to do a murder like this, a wet yeah, work, yeah, yeah, as yeah. they say. That, 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 um, that's a perfect time uh, era as well for that sort of operation. Yeah. That because of the temporal and geographic proximities, uh, that this was probably the same agent, probably took both of them out. Mm -hmm. So as I told you, it wasn't, a, it wasn't good, all good news that gays started getting liberated. Within a year, you can find citations about us being called subnormal. And this goes back to the eugenicists. Eugenics, Hitler didn't create eugenics. He wrote in Mein Kampf, he, he, mm -hmm. he praised the California Eugenics Society. He said, we must do as the Americans are. And we had laws on 40, on the books of 40 states by the mid-50s for forced sterility because someone called you a dimwit or you were morally reprehensible or you had a drinking problem or you had a legitimate you know, something like Down syndrome, you know, a, a bylaw. A, a, so you could be forcibly sterilized, sterilized by accusation. 
and a number of institutes would would operate this. This is left I over. I don't think area. I would have made it past primary school, to be perfectly honest. If you'd run away and joined the, uh, you know, the uh, Renfen, sorry, the Ren, the Renfest crew, you could have just joined the circus, as we say in the U.S. Oh, right. Okay. See how that all worked out? Okay. Yeah, I, I have massive feet, enormous feet. So, I mean, that would work out. Anyway, go on. Well, you do. You, not everyone is doomed to the big red uh, shoes. That's that's. It's not. It's not in the contract. Um, so I told you that the Who has blood on their hands. The Who, in concert with a CIA front called U.S. Aid, mm -hmm, USAID, mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. together and said, we need to solve all diseases in Africa with ongoing vaccine campaigns for for centuries until they're all gone. And they went in and I've got the smoking gun of what temporally correlates most closely with the first reports of slim disease. They started reporting this in by the mid seventies. Uh, there were communities in Africa that were saying reporting and showing documentation of slim disease. So they got hit before the hepatitis study in the U S this is one of the people that destroyed a lot of that uh, biological warfare guilt that the CIA carried. Um, and why we know that they destroyed so much is that they destroyed their technical and analytical materials, their culpability. But what had already happened is they'd been doing business with the federal financial apparatus for years. They didn't have all their own independent funding services yet. They weren't doing all of their dirty tricks like they're doing today. They were starting into it, um, but they were still much more into espionage, knocking over people they didn't like, whatever. Indeed, this is Nation. a time where where uh, Helms is is soon going to be um, helping yes. to. He's going to be out front for Watergate and stuff like that. Yep. And here's another one we talked about that big bad, you know, the big bad spooky. Uh, sort of mm, backbone behind all of it. There he is. Now that's the real. If we're looking for a diseased chimp, I am looking at a picture of him right now. Anyway, sorry. I have isolated the virus, and here it is. <laughs> and I can tell you, the aliens. I've said this in the last podcast. I, I I did. The aliens will tell you. He the 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 aliens that appear from the sky nowadays will tell you. You should listen to Kissinger and only Kissinger. The AI is going to tell you the same as well. It's very suspicious. I get a feeling they're not really aliens. So we won't say anything more, but to please pick up this free artifact. It is one in a network of instruments that mm -hmm. show the progressive development of depopulation policy and tactics. That's all I'll say about it. It's not a joke. It's not something you should ignore because despite the suffering that you will experience by realizing that your fellow human beings have been planning and executing this against you for many years, mm -hmm. it will prepare you and make you more likely to survive it. Yeah. And it's a Kissinger memo. And of course, there's a, uh... Some people have reworded some parts of it or um, uh, given, given you know, kind of summarized it. And then that's been used as quotes later on as well, which has caused, I think, it has caused people to think a lot of that is is bump. But if you actually look at the memo itself, you'll, st you'll see what the agenda is. It's written in the words. Anyway, sorry, go on. Not at all. Because of the way that we've clearly, you know, ballooned and my Irish genes have uh, very effectively expressed themselves here. Um, I, you know, we I, I this is not the 15 minute uh, run through that we talked about. It's it's much more conversational, but it's we lied to the audience. I'm so we, sorry. We, we told you that it was safe and effective. And then before you knew it, it was 11 o'clock at night on a Thursday. Then a before Thursday. you knew it, it, Nick had put it inside you. Yes. The jab I'm talking about. Go oh, on. we. Oi, <laughs> I won't put anything inside you besides good, clean, well vetted information that's oh, free that's good. and publicly cool. verifiable. None of it is dependent upon you. If you want to, I have some recommended books. Uh, there's a couple in particular that I can emphasize. If you want to go read the works of the early whistleblowers, good on you. 
It's a good approach. You'll be very grounded because you get to hear an MD, a PhD, an MPH show you this stuff in excruciating detail, and you hear it from a lettered scientist. You don't hear it from a space cat. Um, so that's a good place to start. Or you can just jump into the deep end of all of the, the stuff that I include, including these, uh, most importantly, these artifacts that are linked here in the timeline. And that can be where you cut your teeth. So we talked about Dr. Prince going over to Africa, running that facility, the implications to the African AIDS story. Uh, he wrote a book called The Poetry of Life. Oh, God. In science, in Africa. Is that, is, is, it, is that Darwin on the front? Oh, no, it's John Kenneth Galbraith. It actually does look like John Kenneth Galbraith. I'm not sure whose eyes. There probably were his because he is the type of scientist. I, I can understand, but that the whole the whole mock-up of that chimp with glasses on, it seriously does look like John Kenneth Galbraith. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That's I his love. cover. I love it. Um, I told you that the, the hepatitis, I, I've said a couple of times, in living animals, in living animals. Guess what the formula was on the books in 1975? After a early... New York only hepatitis study resulted in half of the cohort dying. Oh, it wow. was this formula. Here's, the, here's another quick quote. Such plasma blood that you need to begin producing a human vaccine for hepatitis B, such plasma may be suitably obtained from clinically well human chronic hep B carriers or, or alternatively, from chimpanzees which have been naturally or artificially infected with hepatitis B virus and have oh. become chronic carriers, living animals. Then they cull the animal and they filter, they take the kidneys and they take the blood and they produce hepatitis wow. B vaccine. And that's the formula that was used when gay men rolled up their sleeves and took three shots of hepatitis. Uh, Heptavax B was the name of the product at the time. Um, this got out, uh, people knew Pandora's box, uh, was making sound. It was, it was a harpy screeching noise. And for two different, very important historical conferences, they argued and half of the court were showing off their papers and their new NIH grants and bragging about the new chimeric cancer causing viruses that they had created in the lab. And the other half were crying unto heaven. And I think we know who won that match. Here's Dr. Hilleman, the one that swept SV40 under the rug in 1960. Mr. It doesn't cause cancer. We control it with formalin himself. And he's in charge of the hepatitis B vaccine unit at Merck. In case you guys don't know, Merck is the original bio war, institutional bio warfare public private partner to the United States. It happened in World War II. They never let go. They, they got their card renewed every year. They've been a staple. And why that's a problem is because they're a demilitarized zone for prying eyes like FDA in investigators or people that are supposed to be able to see all federal facilities and confirm that they're not working on illegal biowarfare. You put that behind the uh, proprietary walls of Merck Incorporated or Pfizer or any number of the other partners that were listed in the studies, and you have a safe space for whatever the hell you want to do. This is that USAMRID lab. They have gotten a new building. If you go online and look up the new USAMRID facility, your jaw will hit the desk. It's astonishing. Because there's nothing about life or humanity or health happening in there. It's, it's all dark magic. And I told you that there were many conversations, which I think were basically satiated with red herrings. I think that the CIA and the Defense Department got dragged before Congress. But this is an important batch of materials that will give you firsthand insight into the type of experiments that they were conducting on the public. Like going into an FDA building going down to the basement to the water filtration system because they were smart enough to have a, a system to purify the drinking water in the building, infecting it with a pathogen, and then tracking how quickly and how many FDA employees got sick from the drinking oh water. My God. Oh my God. You can read it for yourself. That's monkey versus monkey. 
Okay. Also, <laughs> if you're going to do that kind of thing, <laughs> you're going to need a loophole. You're going to want, you know, you're going to oh, want a yeah. trampoline to land on. You're not going to want a Who doesn't want a loophole? Everybody, everybody loves a loophole. Everybody you loves get a loophole. loophole. You get everybody. a loophole. You get a loophole. <laughs> Um, yeah, and for Ke and for Kevin in the raccoons, you get a bonus hole. You get a bonus hole. Um, so, sorry, he's got a thing about bonus hole. Um, mm -hmm. uh, here are the exceptions that will give you a hall pass in case you want to conduct chemical biological experiments on an un an unknowing public. As long as you're doing things related to medical, therapeutic, pharmaceutical, or agricultural, oh. GMO, industrial, or research activity, those are the specific categories. Oh, to church. Be accepted. Yeah. 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 Wow. So they needed, they needed a loophole. And the year before they gave gay men the Heptavax B, they widened it. They turned it from a single lane tunnel into a six lane superhighway. Yeah. And they removed the annual requirement of the defense and intelligence departments to come before Congress and provide an annual accounting of how they had implemented this loophole. Mm -hmm. They no longer had to report how they had used exceptions. Okay. And this is the end. Mm -hmm. 1,083 volunteers that had to be, according to the enrollment criteria, very healthy, very you know, athletic and sexually active. They had to be hot and everybody wanted them. And they found a thousand of them for the study. And in November, they started getting three shots. Now I have they interviewed. All, they, they all had to be gay. Yes. It was a gay men's study. Just gay. Yeah. Just gay for gay men. Go on. Go on. Yeah. 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 So interesting historical note, just about the same time in Amsterdam, there was a gay men's hepatitis vaccine study, but they wanted nothing to do with the American protocols and they created their own hepatitis vaccine. And guess what? None it of their guys got everybody. sick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I have eyewitness testimony of men who lived in this city and in Los Angeles and San Francisco. I have, I have eyewitnesses from all of the three major sites um, that they knew or were in the study themselves. So uh, the one from New York is just, I just treasure him. He's an angel. And he was there in the neighborhood in lower Manhattan. And he knew all kinds of guys that were bragging that they'd been selected for the study that fall. And he knew as soon as they got their first shots, because they all came in with their gym tone bodies and showed off their Band-Aid. And he knew when very quickly, one, two, three of them at a time would stop coming out and people would start talking and then they would find out that they were dead. And for me, you know, people say, oh, that's anecdotal. Show me the papers. Well, we, we can't see the papers. This was an NIAID slash Tony Fauci managed operation. And the data of the, the unmasked, the, we call it unmasked data, the real identities of the volunteers are not available to the public. You can't FOIA them. They're protected by Department of Defense protections. How in the fuck can that be? Pardon my French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If this was truly to fight hepatitis B and help public health, how in the world all these years later can we not know who they are? We could very quickly go into vital statistics we could go to their families we could do an independent auditor you know audit of their mortalities and prove how many of them died in 79 80 81 and in the summer of 81 that's when they come out of the clause they wanted to move the date this is another important part of rewriting history they wanted to put this push pin. You go to the CDC website and they say AIDS began in 1981. No, it didn't. It began in January and February 1979 in Manhattan. I've spoken to the people who lived there, who saw them. So, you know, and you can go also into other 
formal sources like statistical data for California is another good example. And I find studies in 79 and 80 of clusters of patients who have immunosuppression, pneumonia, they're beginning to present cancers and Kaposi sarcoma. But the CDC and the NIH and the FDA all maintain a hard date that it had to be 1981 because that removes anyone's correlation of saying, you know, I wonder if that vaccine had something to do with this disease that broke out. So that's the end of the presentation. This is my recommended reading list. I'm not going to talk you through these books right now, but these have taught me about how to be an investigator, about stunning information about public health and the practices of cell culture, vaccine production, and other types of biowarfare that have been released on the public. And then my, you know, ode to the OG, the giants upon whose shoulders I stand, the people that really inspired me. And this begins many, 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 many pages. Uh, well, little under 30 pages of references. This is the hard science behind all of these crazy things that have just come out of my mouth. Lovely. I always like the sources, my friend. I always like the sources, Nick. That is, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad, I, I'm, you know, I'm glad we, we uh, that 15 minutes went by really quickly. It flew by. <laughs> it flew by. It flew by. Oh, don't get me started with uh, my, my faux American accent. I can't help it. Um, it's, it's potentially, it's probably racist, really. In the future, they'll say, Why? Oh, my God. No. They'll, they'll, yeah, no. they'll ban me. Oh, you should hear my Indian accent. That's definitely racist. I'm, I'm 100% sure. Anyway, and see, I have, uh, I've worked with Indians for so long that, yes, when you do, oh, if you, you know, if you do an inflection and, and, and imitate that, they, I will, they love I will, you. I, yeah, yeah, you get lots of fans. But I will also yeah. say to everybody out there on this topic right now, we're going to we're going to nip this in the bud. I have nothing but respect and admiration and envy for people who are truly multilingual. Mm -hmm. What an amazing talent and discipline to apply yourself and you know, I had to learn all this stuff. I didn't have room for French in my head. I can say mm -hmm. zutalo, you know, but I you know, I I can order some food. I know a few words in many languages. But for people that are truly bilingual and multilingual, we respect you. Hats off. Yeah, I, well, I speak enough French to get by, but I, 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 I know that I have like this point where I'm a limit where I don't consider myself as being able to properly speak French. And I know there's this bit just afterwards. And God, man, I know loads of people around this area. I mean, talk about Indians where I live. There's loads of Indians where I live. It's fantastic. I really like it. All very polite. Um, some of them speak English better than others. But I mean, you never know who can do the secondary thing, who can pick up the languages easily uh, and who end up doing the research like you're doing as well because i i mean this is you have to be motivated uh by certain things we've just been through i i mean i've noted down a few things there was a couple of things like what morris hillman um was doing afterwards i was i, I was uh answered within it and there was a few things that were really interesting i mean the overall point um was there was some areas that obviously i would like to center in on myself i've been on this adventure where i've been looking into um viruses now for a while and gain of function research um since covid19 outbreak and i had to go down a rabbit hole and i like to go back further than most people so my my, my i went back to like the late 1800s and early 1900s and got up to a probably uh, like 1920s to 1930s got up to how the research had started off um and i knew that when you know what i see from this is a much you know is the next stage is the advance on is the oh we worked out the technologies of how to do this and we're going to do it on mass uh irrelevant of the consequences and you like mentioned people like the uh rockefeller uh foundation and mm -hmm. they were still active right at the beginning of uh that millennia back in like uh 1910 it would be um the 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 uh, person who was, uh, uh, I think he was Secretary of State for America at the time, wanted to send somebody to the Manchurian um, plague outbreak in 
China um, to represent the Americans at an international symposium. And uh, it, they, that he was like, well, I don't know who he was. I think it was a guy called Stimson or something. And he went to, uh, he went to the Rockefeller uh, Institute or Foundation to um, tell him, advise him on who to send because that's what they were doing. They were already, they had made themselves fundamentally important to the powers that be at that time. So there's a lot of the, the, this is one of the things like right? there's a lot to take in there. So first, I want to start kind of far away from something, which is that what I'm talking about there with there's a certain number of societies and organizations that keep popping up when I'm looking into gain of function research, it's history and the protection from prosecution of those involved in uh, uh, to the occasions where it goes wrong. Um and the cover-ups that follow and, and uh, pouring I, down oh excuse me yeah i know i know i know i'm pouring down of course um but but there's two parts of that i mean pouring down is able to hide behind the ministry of defense but a lot of the time mm -hmm. the people who are working on the edges and the outskirts of the pharmaceutical big pharma sector have massive links to things like the royal society i don't think people understand quite what type of of um a place that is and you were talking about it being the place where was it to jump hooper to to uh to to kind of like jump on his claims they invite him into the royal society and then they can all belittle him together um is that it's how you kill a hypothesis yes you take the one champion who has the evidence and they just they just bulldozed over him mm -hmm. and he did not have a team his scientific colleague was william hamilton bill hamilton an evolutionary biologist and bill and he had gone to africa twice to collect um a chimpanzee scat so that they could sequence sivs they were starting they were doing true hard science they were gathering evidence and uh, Bill got malaria on the second trip and died. And uh, so, so Ed walked into that fight all by himself, literally. I, 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 as I looked at the, the footage in the documentary about him, you get to see precisely what happened and what, how they treated him. Uh, and I know something about Stanley Plotkin. He's the American who, who snuck his way into the lab origin research group. Some of these people that I'm I'm giving praise to, and he was sitting right there in the Royal Society meeting in 2001, mm -hmm. and gave them all the preparations they need to write those papers. I know that because when I digitized Dr. Cantwell's collection, he included a number of emails. He had printed up the full email, and you know, back in the day, everybody in the two and the CC field is all you know bunged up at the top. So I got to see who was in this conversation. Well, there's Dr. So-and-so, and there's so-and-so from the NIH. Oh, and here's Stanley Plotkin. And Stanley got copied in. Someone thought, and he probably played his role very well, that he was a well-meaning senior elder vaccinology scientist who was going to help them crack the case. And he took all of the quite legitimate bench insights that they were driving towards and took that over to the Royal Society and prepared them to lynch Ed Hooper. That's how that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I'm I'm not sure. I think it might have been um, Robert May, who was the president of the Royal Society during that period. And if it is Robert May, well, he's, the, in a sense, a mentor to Roy Anderson, who, of course, invented a lot of the, um, the modeling, and who was a mentor in turn to Neil Ferguson, who everybody knows very well, during COVID-19 and through foot and mouth. Um, and that was a period where um, we saw foot and mouth starting in the UK um, that had come from uh, meddling in labs. There's a lot of um, things that happen during these times that you don't understand why they'd need to cover up until you look at the uh, atmosphere and the environments at the time. And uh, that that period, I'm, it's not a surprise that the, the Royal Society is a base for, for the jump, because um, I would be interested to know I, I, on another occasion, if you I, I, like, uh, uh, if you if you uh, have time, if you've got anything else that links to the Royal Society, it'd be very interesting, because I'm, I'm very interested 
interested in um, researching them after I did the Welcome Five article and discovered that nearly everybody who was involved in like the COVID nineteen setup cover up the proximal origin paper cover up uh, all had some sort of um attachment to the royal society in a way that looked like they had been rewarded for different things they'd done in the past so i find that the links to the old uh world order very interesting and that i also find about um kissinger and nixon and you were talking about them in the 70s and how they started to reframe how you talk about these things um and you were saying you know, they always played uh watch the birdie you know they always made mm -hmm. you watch the other hand and they did the same during this period with pakistan where they they uh they 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 said oh we're not going to give you nuclear weapons and in actual fact they were supplying them and helping them get nuclear technology through other uh, other ways so it's not a surprise to see the these old boys um involved and it, uh, this is something that interests me because of course i'm on a conspiracy web so we see these old boys about and you've mentioned on a few times the cia and yes. it's obviously the cia have been heavily involved in certain aspects of these gain of function research um what what do you think their roles are do you do, do, what do you think they're like what what part of this do you think the cia handles is there anything that you've come across that makes sense um i would say uh first of all really really appreciated your thoughts there thank you for you know for what you um have and how it fits together i think the puzzle being international puzzlers what well, i don't know what the, what the you know puzzle puzzle players um and putting all of the pieces together is the terror for these folks they don't want this explained yeah. Ooh, they, yeah. they've been doing it in public sight and using the philanthropic uh astroturf Oh, we're this is for the good of this is for the greater good. We're going to save Africa, and you find out the next thing you know that they're trying to squelch reports that there was a contaminant in a vaccine trial that they conducted on a very remote little village, so that hopefully it would never get out if something went awry, and that all of the young women are sterile, yeah, because yeah, they put yeah. the sexual hormone in the product. And then it makes an autoimmune reaction. And when you express sexual hormone personally, then your body attacks yourself and it impedes pregnancy. Mm. You know, no, that's, that's the kind of stuff. They're desperate. They're desperate for that sort of thing as well. It's very yes, interesting. Yes, yes. So, um, so about, about the framework, um, I, I, would I would like to say this, you know, to answer your question about Royal Society and do I know, I would say that I, I have the puzzle piece on this side of the pond. And we call it the National Academies of Science National Research Council. It's the U.S. mirror, as many things. I've mm. just recently really taken in how much influence the British intelligence group has on our last almost century, that during and after the big one, that they helped us build and structure the CIA, and they taught us the dirty tricks, murder you know, uh, murder made to look like suicide, et cetera, et cetera. The false indications and warnings, all of these things. Um, that was, um, I, you know, I don't look at the UK and say, everyone is Mary Poppins. You know, I, I, that was when I was a kid. Sure. But, uh, you know, I, I really, it was hard for me to take that in. But it was also good because it helped me accept that that kind of hardened, um, whatever you want to call it, postmodern morality or, or, or psychopathy is probably a better word, exists in a network of people around the world who have said they, they psychologically cleave themselves away from the rest of the world. They live in their own pocket dimension already, and that can afford them the moral turpitude or lack of turpitude to proceed with a number of different vectors in depopulation. It's in food. It's contaminants. It's things that cause cancer because they watched what happened with SV40 and all of the monkey contamination from the 50s. And you better believe they've built a great part of their empire through oncology and the cancer framework. So, you know, I think they're learning and, and improving upon these tools and models. 
And uh, I think it's very important that we take the major players around the world. And I think there are people, there's people who've already done that. If you look to Horowitz, uh, 1997, uh, Leonard Horowitz, Emerging Viruses. It's on my recommended reading list, but it's absolutely brilliant for a quick high level primer. It's not one of these, you know, you're going to slit your wrists because it's a history book. He does a chapter and stitches a whole bunch of things together. And his citation base is, it's insane. He, he cites better than anybody I know. It's extremely grounded. And none of it is Newsweek or Star News. None of it is mainstream press. It's all um, governmental, military defense, and particularly scientific basis. So that's why I recommend him because he puts together th that big part of the story and goes far back in history and puts it together with uh, really the parent, which we now see emerging in current geopolitics, that they're trying to make as the 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 big brother that's going to help us and and alert us to all of the emerging diseases, and that's the World Health Organization. That's the storefront, and then you've got these hard, deep, cold, callous silos in the background in different national or, or geological locations. There's probably, I think, five or six centers of power that we're talking about that have been on board with this. And at the World Health Organization Population Conference in 1974, friends and neighbors and countrymen, 173 of our beloved countries signed an accord and agreed to deliberately, specifically, precisely follow this, uh, this agenda of turning down the faucet of life on earth through a number of different tools. So anyhow, I'll park my mouth. <laughs> I like how you speak. I always like how you speak. Uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy it very much. So I, you don't have to park your mouth too quickly. Um, well, there's, there's so many, I mean, I'm, or of course I have um, an interest in, in which, part you know this is interesting which part the the something like an organization has uh, like the cia has to play or an organization like the royal society has to play or organization at the end of the day they all tend to be acting within some form of framework that's looks like round table groups and looks like it's the same sort of control structures that were uh, ideas from the late 1800s and early 1900s and again that's where i go back to find a lot of the rampant dangerous ideology behind um gain of function research and experimentation i mean just uh what they started doing after um that international symposium in um china uh onwards um after after post nine nineteen eleven, 19 11 <laughs> not 9 11 post 19 11 um uh, up to the point you're you're talking about has such an interesting you know they they tried everything that, and there was loads of viruses that suddenly emerged and it's really interesting each time you try and follow one of these threads how quickly it disappears but i suppose your you what you've done is concentrate on an era where there is a load of evidence there is an infrastructure to have a, a look at so you can get a much clearer version of what was going on and uh, it, it leads to so many um like i i think that the technology uh, uh came at that same time where um the ideas of population control were trending within the elite and within the policy makers in the the back rooms dark rooms of the policy makers and so this sort of like virus this technology this um idea of how to use viruses colliding with this late 60s early 70s uh dark policy making and dark governments i think i think this is obviously what we are looking at now is what you've described that's what you've described i have some questions okay i i, I I know that wasn't that was more of a statement there but i have i have a, a couple of questions some of them uh, are te uh, 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 tech um questions really uh, technical questions sure um so so and one of some some of them you won't you won't have any clues I, I'm, I'm sure i'm just asking them uh out loud but chimps right so 
it's very interesting that that they obviously use chimp viruses because they're very close to with the chimps are very close to humans and and so on that's the basis of what we we think do chimps have m- more viruses or less viruses than the human is it that they have less like uh, uh they have um cuz they are i i don't know less evolved or they, they, certain parts that are less complicated uh, have the human evolution only been allowed because our body's been able to f- learn to fight viruses and what keeps a chimp from evolving from a chimp is the amount of viruses that will kill them off at an early age that's I, I would say without looking it up i would posit my my uh, educated guess would be uh, humans by far just have because more viruses. Uh, well so okay so there's a scale of uh the microorganism microorganism being hopefully a good all-inclusive term uh that includes rna viruses mm-hmm. dna viruses and then there are different classifications of microorganisms like phage things that are blobby and gooey uh, uh, and things that are pleomorphic, which is a lovely word, a mouthful that means something like a frog that goes through multiple Ooh. stages repeatedly. And that's one of its uh, very effective mechanisms to avoid uh, clinical treatment is that it can go into a latent state like a cyst. And it has literally a calcium shell around that little seed. And it waits till whatever, you know, whatever that it's a timing or a chemical signal and then pop and it's spring again. And it's a actively mm-hmm. destructive little bugger in the body again. Uh, there's a whole, the point of all of that is that there's a whole scale of things. And I am trying to be diligent about walking up and down that ladder and looking at the health relationships and the strange groupings like when you get up to the parasites think of a parasite like a city bus and some of them i'm sorry are double deckers and inside are a whole nother community of toxic and dangerous things so when you kill the parasite you have this very acute herxamer reaction things like that and looking at the you know looking at that whole uh, spectrum so coming back to my educated guess, because of leaning into more of the veterinarian and parasitology data in the last year or so, because I'm, I'm really trying to look at cancer in practical and effective ways that help the most people put tools in their hands, that whether or not we go and get every test and prove this particular risk, there are certain things that can be done in therapies that have a buckshot, a broad scatter effect across a number of cancer risks from this domain. But the point is this, there are two factors that are extremely different for people versus chimpanzees. Chimpanzees do not have grinder. Chimpanzees do not have glory holes. And I won't go any further into the uh, the sticky underworld of the male libido, uh, but there are there are a great number of sexual behaviors in the human that make it biologically at a higher count because we constantly sample each other. We don't live in a little ivory tower unless yeah, yeah, you yeah. are chaste and pristine and good on you. If that's been your life, wow, you you literally have something to show for it now. And that's a great lack of these, these pathogens and parasites. Um, the other factor is diet. Chimpanzees do not eat food, you know, food that is flown from the other side of the world that could have any number of cysts or uh, living parasites in it. They don't eat fish that's fish from one side of the world and then frozen and shipped to the other side of the world where there are a great number of aquatic. I mean, my God, the number of microorganisms in the sea, that's its own science. Yeah, I, I won't even bring it up. But that, those are the two factors that tell me humans mm-hmm. through diet and sexual behavior, a, a much, much higher number. Uh, by the way, just in the parasite category, not talking about viruses or subvirus family members, uh, humans can uh, accumulate up to a thousand parasites in their lifetime. Different types of parasites. So, that's it, that. it may, yeah, it makes me wonder whether or not um, 
then you know it, it makes me posit guesses of why that is but obviously a lot of it is to do we don't travel chimps don't travel around uh, the world they live in very small community chimp communities are very chimp communities are very distinct um all of that sort of stuff well, yes their diet their diet doesn't very they don't sample uh, thai food you know well, well, some chimps some chimps have probably sampled Thai food. <laughs> well, um, and actually, they're lucky if they had the pad Thai. If they had vegetarian pad Thai, they uh, they lucked out. Um, uh, but uh, but I'm saying that any yeah. of these international, this now global food sourcing model that we're living in is only mm-hmm. complicating. Um, I'd say more along the parasitic line. There's a higher yeah, risk yeah, yeah. for a parasite burden in in that channel. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, I, 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 it was a very simplistic question for my own, but you, you, it made sense what you said. I think it made sense. Okay, couple, a couple other things, a couple other things. Then we, we, we look towards rounding up because I've obviously, yeah, you know, I, I've taken a lot of time. There's some very interesting things you mentioned. U.S. aid. I just wanted to make a note to people who are listening that um, you were, in the '60s, a lot of programs uh, were discovered to have been funded by the CIA and CIA conduits, and and later on organizations like like USAID, which are kind of development organizations and um, are, are really just uh, conduits for um, to do things that the CIA would have done before but would get told, told off. So U- USAID uh, works like that, if uh, anybody's wondering. A question I had was, uh, you, or I think you basically answered there as well, which was about um, latent viruses uh, within cells and going into sleep cycles. Is that what we see? Um, with like winter flu pandemics or whatever is this what we're seeing latent sleep cycles or is there something even more so that that we don't understand about that um it's very important uh because i i need of course i have universes of speculation and ideation about what might be happening in the world um but because of the nature of my work it's really important that I stay close to verifiable data. Mm-hmm. Don't speculate. Uh, and a hypothesis is a speculation with some level of evidence. It's not a hypothesis unless there's some kind of evidence about things. Um, so let's talk you know, about what I, I'll tell you about hard evidence that I learned about the RSV. That was that early mentioned chimpanzee. Yeah, yeah, no, left, another, left my that, son in a critical condition. Uh, a, a few a few months ago. Okay, so because it can now just travel from person to person, hospitals are an unfortunate. Uh, you remember the Borg, mm-hmm. and the Borg all communicated through that brilliant little thing called a vinculum with all the green lights. And uh, you know when uh, Captain Janeway tapped into the vinculum with her little probes. Okay, sorry. I- dangerous dangerous nerd zone here no no um, I'm, I'm fine keep going yes but, but they used they used a word in i it's a it's an it's an image from pop culture that i like to pull in for people sometimes it's because we're like oh yeah i saw that episode um and the word vinculum isn't science fiction it means a a bundled conduit for data and um the vinculum that i try to work through is correlating these things, you know, looking at, um, and that's why anthropology, I think, is much easier than the folks that are arguing the the fear and cleavage sites, the P53 down regulation, all of the, you know, the big headlines right now about disease mechanisms of COVID. I have a much easier path with regard to the bulk of evidence that's already there. So let's talk about RSV and what happened and the vinculum that I used for that. I looked at epidemiologic studies, retroactive studies, before the era where they were scrubbing most of the damning truth out of papers, where before your preprint would make it, uh, you, your, your co-authors and advisors and reviewers would redline the hell out of most things that would give rise to evidence or provide evidence or even suggest iatrogenic injury. In the United States, I think it's the second leading cause of death. Complications from surgery, complications from treatments, adverse reactions to biological products. So um, I looked at a good set of retroactive 
studies about vaccines and New York City and pneumonia. And this is what I found. One, chimpanzee substrate and or living chimpanzees were produced, were the production model during this era. So RSV, originally chimpanzee coriza agent, a very common little carrier pathogen for them, nothing that really causes them problems and gives us pneumonia, was constantly being seeded into the annual products. Then the other important milestone that I see is that following the initiation of each vaccine season was that bell curve of pneumonia deaths. So that's the data that I look at. Uh, how many people are now, you know, when we say another, another yes. unfortunate use of vinculum is in the hospital, that exposures, you know, I say stay the heck out of a hospital if you can possibly help it for the risk of exposure to someone else mm -hmm. that's got something that's transmissible. Because you see the way that, that individual bed bays are separated by a little yeah. silky curtain on a track. You can see a foot and a half above and below, you know, in most, in most rooms, there isn't any biological separation of patients at all. In fact, it's a risk. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, I understand. And when I said earlier, I mean, that what you just said there, mate, uh, my, my, my son got an RSV and then that led to a, a secondary infection, pneumonia, um, went into critical condition. And the thing is, is that if anything had happened there, then it, it, it you know, it would be put down to things like pneumonia and secondary infections and things like that. Um, and you can, I mean, the effect, the, the, the effect this has had, how many, I mean, I would, I would say, I, 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 I would say that th this sort of research has surely led to more deaths than both world wars combined, surely. Um, I mean that's the speculation I'm 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 putting out, but there must have been quite um, a death count uh, involved in this research. Is there any way for us to try and posit a guess of how 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 costly state gain of function research around the world has been on human life? Uh, I know it's about it's about diagnostics and pathology data that we're missing. Mm -hmm. so we yeah. could speculate we could yeah. we could we could we could draw projections and um you know in the in the universes i say plural universes of <laughs> statistics mark twain by the way said there are liars damned liars and statisticians <laughs> I thought you were gonna. Well, he would say there's liars, damned liars, and Neil Ferguson, who's a member of the Royal Statistical Society. Oh no, Neil. poor yeah. Neil. Poor yeah, Neil. what can you do? He's a, he's a member of the team. He's just a lower down member of the team. Well, isn't he a bit chunky? Isn't yeah. he been hitting the chockies and the bickies a bit? Oh, I haven't been watching. I've been watching, mate. I, 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 I'm be, I'm been caring about him, hoping that something yeah. happened, maybe fell off the edge. If you know what I mean. Um, I, no, I'm thinking of a of a British scientist named Neil. I might not have the right. It might be a no, different Neil. I'm, no, I'm, I'm talking about yeah, Neil Ferguson, who's a lot uh, a lot behind a lot of the um uh, computer modeling that was uh, done with COVID, in especially in Britain, who said that five hundred thousand people would die. He also did the same with bird flu in China, where he said 200 million people would die and it was like 5,000 people or something so so he's he's Roy Anderson's boy Roy Anderson full royal society he's a full boy well we I, I mean coming up right up to the end I, I mean this has been really interesting loads of information this is a a, a wealth of information that has me asking a load of different questions um to myself and but like understanding of how viruses works is we have to trust these authorities so it's really hard to know what's true or what's not and we're obviously all like trudging along through this really deep uh, muggy swamp um and you mentioned things like um helper viruses um that would cause like viral carcinogenesis or whatnot yes that, you got it you got it you get it uh, yeah lad. yay well, well well i mean going into that territory isn't that like like that's just the the thought of what that means is enormous that's you know is it that can it what i what i'm trying to say is that is 
is cancer a new thing then or is it just multiplied massively by uh something that has been done to us uh cancer has been as evidence through history a a minor compartment of human disease and death which magnified and blew open with you know a a, a rocket launcher in the 1950s with the introduction of so many additional uh, co-factors. Mm-hmm. Now, let's 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 as we bring the plane. You know, we're putting our seats seat backs in the full upright position. We're locking our tray tables. We're 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 storing our personal items here. Um, let's see if there are maybe one or two very salient takeaways from the AIDS disaster that we need to take to heart, not with fear or avoidance, but as a sword to cut through the things that may become a challenge in our own lives and health. What we learned was that for the most part, the problems with a complicated immune system, a depressed immune system really had nothing to do with the agent that did that piece of it. It had to do with all of these other exotic fruits and vegetables out there in the microbiology world that we acquire through different channels. In the gay community, there was a biological homogeny because of so much sex together. So they had all sampled each other, and there was much more. You know, think of the blend. Pretty sexy in the pretty pretty sexy in the gay community is well known. Yep, and uh, in the straight community, there is still a great number of viruses and pathogens of concern from the perspective of sexual behavior. But we are all subject to, regardless of what you know, what side of the sidewalk you're on, we're all subject to the risks of the parasitic burden. That comes from everything. That comes from the environment, from fruits and vegetables, literally, <laughs> uh, from, from uh, pets, from vaccines, from our sexual encounters. We can get paras- certain parts of the parasite list come from sexual exchange. But that's, that's a broader, an umbrella risk that we all face. So what are the takeaways about that? First action, point of action, learn about parasitic cleanse. Pursue parasitic cleanse. You might be at high risk for a very bad parasitic burden, which will exacerbate how you feel. Headaches, feeling sick, being sick out the back end, just um, an awful time for a few days, which might tempt you to stop. So before you get into, oh, I'll just get, oh, I saw that post. Someone say, Ted said, take this and this and this and this. I'm jumping in today. No, no, no. Learn about Herxheimer effect and give yourself, you know, the justice, you know, do, do the effort of at least consulting with your primary care physician and say, I'm going to start a parasite cleanse in earnest. I want it to be effective. How do I mitigate the toxic reactions that we know I'm, I'm at risk of experiencing? Why is that the big takeaway? Because it's very practical and it applies to anybody. And we will all hear discussions like this and say, oh, that's not my demographic. So I don't need to worry about that. Mm-mm. You know, just think about the things that are, that are uh, affecting us and about all the things we've eaten and breathed and the pets we've been around all the times a dog has licked your mouth, whatever. Uh, and the fact is that we're living in a sea of microorganisms. It's our planet. But we can be proactive about giving ourselves a fighting chance, about not having another, like you said, a secondary or tertiary uh, thing that crops up and takes advantage of us when something knocks us back, like a COVID infection. Um, is there anything else about that era that you think is important tonight to, um, to make sure that we, and I think that's a very positive note. It's an action you can take with, instead of just churning in fear or, or disbelief about all of this stuff, you can go and put that to use in your own health and in your loved ones. If you're in a married relationship, both of you should do it. Why would one of you go off and, and do a guinea pig experiment and maybe cleanse some very dangerous things out of your body? Go and then continue to have your, your biological connection with your partner and get reinfected with all that stuff. So be, be keen about your strategy. And there's no problem in reading up on it first. 
I love base level solutions. I love, I love, I, I mean, the, when, whenever you, um, do loads of research and you tell people loads of these scary things, all these technical terms, all these big actors who are doing nefarious things all over the place, really all you want is someone to say, but what it actually gets down to, the nuts and bolts of it is, uh, yep. this society is broken over here. You want to create a new society. So let's think about that. You know, uh, you, your, your health is in danger here you need to do this to get out of this you need to think about your body instead of just shoving everything in there and eventually uh you may find that you've been living with a sickness or a parasite or something that you've not known for years uh, about or uh, and a healthy routine that's been given to you by these same people who um, want to obviously infect us with many different diseases nick this is a been an enlightening conversation i don't think this is the last time we're going to have a conversation because there's loads i'd like to talk to you about um in the future i think there's also this is something that's going to ramp up i I mean talking to you about covid19 and your opinions on that would be of course interesting and i'm sure you have a few um is there anything else you want to say to the people uh apart from that last takeaway about um where to find you and what you're up to now um, yeah, let's end on another high note. I will certainly share over uh, the link for my um, my Rumble channel, where there are a number of pretty pretty decent, succinct, not not you know large conversations like this. Um, some of them are thirty minute, uh, some of them are sixty minute, uh, but good selections from conversations I've had with investigators and researchers. And you know, I, what what do you call yourself? Are you a journalist? Are you a podcaster? Are you a scientist? What is what's your name? No, me personally, I'm a. I always say investigative journalist, but I I, I never even know. No, no, it's fine. No, perfect. But that that's um, it's it, it, anyhow the the. Uh, the way to find me, if you want to just chat, I have my direct messages open is go to Twitter and I'm, and you've seen me, you know, in, in the stream here a couple of times, I'm at pizza pickles per one R it, cat. Those are cat names. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I'm very, I'm very direct and engaging. Um, I, I don't try to get into big long technical conversations on Twitter just because um, if it's, uh, it, you know, there, there could be things that are sensitive or concerning. There are certain things that I, that I say in conversations like this that I don't there. I have to, you know, just think of it as sort of uh, uh, an area where it's been very beneficial to my reach. And so I need to be very cautious that I don't cut myself off from the community. Uh, and then, like I said, I've got a scientific depot called a Zotero site. And all of these links, you know, make sure that Johnny has all of them um, and we can get you connected. What I'm sharing right here when I said let's leave on one more high note is um, this when you say I've got a child who had a very difficult bout with RSV is Mm -hmm. let's look for the hidden treasures in uh, the literature. And it's very, very simple. So I went into this search and, and typed the words inhibit RSV. And then I scrolled down and found the first paper, the scientific link, not an article, not mainstream media. Uh, And let's see here. Okay. Uh, And then let's see if this has got the function here. Uh, You can always go over to related information on PubMed. So let's do that. This is in directly an individual paper about some kind of an investigation of, um, and it looks like an approach and 51 different compounds being used to see about, and it would make sense, they're making Mm. sure, how do we collapse the reproductive cycle of the RSV in the body? That's really the key. And so this would be a good paper to start with. But then you come over to PubMed. And PubMed has a little bit easier, quick and easy way to grab lots of articles together. So you just toggle over to PubMed. And the way that it works here is when you take that journey over from the National Library of Medicine, you arrive here and it aggregates a whole bunch of papers. We've got 23 results right now. And what's very interesting 
is that mm. there's a whole era that we know RSV was killing people annually with pneumonia. It was contaminating publicly uh, administered and scheduled biological products. But there's no papers in this particular return. So before we look at this, let's go all the way back. Let's do a custom range and say, I want to see back to 1955. They didn't call it RSV in 1955, but there were papers that when it crossed over and did that designation shift and became RSV, um, that's when it should begin appearing in the papers. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind, there's sometimes there are synonyms. And RSV has another synonym called Rouse sarcoma virus, nothing to do with respiratory syncytial virus. So you just need to be aware if you are going to look, you know, and dig on RSV uh, that you're differentiating and that we are talking about respiratory syncytial virus. So here's a good indicator that we are in the exact right spot. Inhibitors of, and they spell out the full proper name. Okay, so that's it. Then you can take these blobs of data and let's see, is it still, is it showing you my Zotero now? Did we switch over to Zotero? Yeah, there it is. I see it. Okay, brilliant. I, I export those things, these blobs with very specific questions. And I'm careful about the timeline of what I'm gathering. And then I send it to a citation manager. And it makes a single file for me. I don't have to copy paste anything. Check by, if you want, you can daisy pick the things that you want to pull into your collection, but you just send it out to a citation manager file. And then I use my free Zotero and I import it and it becomes a new collection. And from there, I can organize and separate it based on, you know, the structure of what I've got here. But that's the basis of how I do this. I'm going to share my Zotero link. We're going to also share the presentation that we just talked to for, for two and a half hours, the shortest 15 <laughs> minutes ever, um, and uh, also the Rumble link. And, and, and my, you know, you've already heard my Twitter handle, but I've got a, a link to the Zotero from, from uh, Twitter, by the way. I'll never stop calling it Twitter. It's not X, it's Twitter. Yeah, I agree. So there we go. Those are all the connective tissues and a little cherry on the Sunday. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like it very much. And hey, thanks for joining me. Um, I will put all of the stuff in the show notes. Um, that that isn't a. I mean, what you're doing there is mapping out something that needs to be mapped out properly. Um, I would love to um get involved with some parts if you have a certain idea that something suspicious is going on and you have uh, trouble trying to find something. Um, I'm very good at finding, like thinking about details in a different way and finding uh things that people don't know are there. So if you ever find something that you think exists but has to exist the evidence shows that there's two things and there's something in the middle let me know what that something is and i can always go and help you i i i've it's been wonderful to speak with you and thanks for coming on the news based podcast and teaching us about a lot likewise thank you so much i can't wait to have a continuation of the conversations beautiful nick thank you